In this video, first I'm going to talk about Leibniz's law of identity. Then I'm going to apply Leibniz's law to the relation between the mind and the brain to show that the mind cannot be the same entity as the physical brain. This is a response to a video by DRESD83 on consciousness. Since Gary Edwards covered the latter part of the video dealing with bundle theory and properties, I will just delve into the first part. So first of all, I just want to let you guys know that DRESD's script for this video is literally reproduced from a conversation that I had with him in the comment section of his response to my video on Searle's Chinese room argument. Having responded to his assertions, I'm tempted to call him a dishonest prick, but I'll save that for later. So he gives us a thought experiment regarding color perception. This is a response to my argument regarding qualia inversion. He's saying that it's possible that these two women have no difference in their brain states, but have difference in their mental states. I would argue that this is false. The violinists you see in this video are playing the same notes, but they don't hear the same thing because they have different brains. Their brains are changing throughout this entire symphony. In fact, I would argue that it is logically impossible for them to have any difference in mental states and yet be molecular identicals of each other because the only thing that is identical is itself. As William Lane Craig puts it, For identity is a necessary relation. There is no possible world in which some entity A is not identical to A. Identicals molecularly must be identical mentally. A property of matter is that every aspect of what a matter is like is knowable from either observing matter, directly with one's eyes, or with scientific instruments. Did you catch it? He didn't talk about the ontology of matter, he talked about the experience of matter. We're not talking about what matter is like, we're talking about what matter is. We're talking about the properties of matter that explain its behavior. That is not a property which mental states have. For instance, what it is like to experience seeing the color sky blue. The next experiment is trickier for the himba. In this one, they are shown a circle of green squares, which includes one blue square. So again, 12 colors, and you point towards the one that is different from the other 11 colors. For us, we have separate words for green and blue. But as the himba have the same word for both, it takes them longer to spot the blue. <laughs> For instance, what it is like to experience seeing the color sky blue. For instance, what it is like to experience seeing the color sky blue. There is no what it is like regarding seeing sky blue because sky blue isn't a discrete entity. All you've done is tokenize it based on similarities you see between other objects emitting the same wavelength of electromagnetic radiation. What the sensation is like is not knowable from looking at brain scans or looking at the electrical activity in the brains of people who are seeing the color sky blue. Now this argument may seem contentious at first, and that is why I'm going to strengthen the argument by referencing the phenomenon of inverted qualia. You've got to be shitting me. The best way to understand inverted qualia and why it implies non-identity between the brain and the mind is to consider a hypothetical person named Sandra. Sandra experiences the color red when everybody else experiences green. Alright, so here's a common assumption that qualia have a norm of some sort. They don't. What DRESD is doing here is attempting to divorce qualia from a perspective. The question is, about whose green and whose red are you talking? Red and green don't just exist unto themselves. There isn't an objective red or an objective green. Sue's green is incorrigibly green to her and to everyone else who has the percept as Marvin Minsky notes. Well, what they talk about is the difference between a third-person analysis, I see blue because it's a certain wavelength and it hits the retina this way, and you do all the analysis. All that differentiated from what they say the first-person experience is that this qualia, this sensation that, that 
can't be communicated to anyone else. I don't know if the blue I see looks the same to the blue you see, even though we both call it blue, because that's this first-person experience. And the fact that there is a first-person experience means that consciousness is something special. Well, the first answer is that what you see as blue is not the same as what I see as blue. Suck on that! Because I have different mental processes. So they're making some kind of assumption that's that's just plain silly. Uh, it's also logically possible that Sandra has no difference compared to normal individual in the physical states in her brain. For identity is a necessary relation. There is no possible world in which some entity A is not identical to A. So if there's any possible world in which A is not identical to B, then it follows that A is not in fact identical to B. I'm not saying this is actually what occurs, I'm saying it's logically possible. The way we could potentially know via physical observation if Sandra has brain state M1, normal qualia, or M2, inverted qualia, is to either observe her behavior or observe her brain states. But it's logically possible she does not differ. Well, the first answer is that what you see as blue is not the same as what I see as blue because I have different mental processes. So they're making some kind of assumption that's that's just plain silly. She can't tell us either because she simply doesn't know. From this it follows that mental states are unknowable via physical observation. Mental states have a property not possessed by physical states and this violates Leibniz's law. In response, many try to deny that it's logically possible that Sandra's brain states do not differ from that of a normal individual. Establishing that it's logically possible is actually quite easy, based first of all on the fact that it can be conceived of, and more importantly on the fact that its negation doesn't seem to be logically necessary. <laughs> oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> so in response to this, I commented, your ability to conceive of something doesn't tell you whether or not it's logically possible. I can conceive of traveling back in time and killing my grandfather, but that doesn't mean it's logically possible. You're confusing epistemic precedents with ontological precedents. The fact that 4,500 years ago the Sumerians did not know that clay tablets were made of subatomic particles doesn't mean that there exists a possible world wherein clay tablets aren't made of subatomic particles. In the same way, experiencing a mental state and not knowing if it has an underlying cause doesn't mean it doesn't have an underlying cause. Now in response, Animating Re Re Rebel said, Polly, your argument against conceivability entailing possibility is bad. I already addressed a variant of it in my response to Ander Smith, but I'll repeat it here. You need to take into account the distinction between primary intentions and secondary intentions. So even when you think you're going back in time to kill your grandfather, you're conceiving of a scenario that looks as if you're going back in time and killing your grandfather. There could be a twin earth that looks just like this one and a conception that would seem to result in a contradiction on this earth would not apply on the twin earth. So if someone says they're conceiving of water without H2O, what they're really conceiving of is some watery-like substance composed of XYZ. So no, your objection fails to refute the conceivability argument. Plus, do you actually think that arguments such as yours refute the idea of being able to conceive of a unicorn? You really need to do better than just saying conceivability fails us at times. Well, fuck you! But actually, I would apply that same reasoning to DRS's claim about conceivability of different mental states with the same molecular neural structure. He's only conceiving of a scenario that looks as if they have the same molecular neural structure, when in fact, they don't. Regarding his point about unicorns, Annie's point, unicorns are made of atoms. My conceiving of a unicorn would just be my brain doing an elaborate photoshop of what is already there. That's not the case with the thought experiment DRES is presenting, so that fails. Any statement which is conceivable, whose negation is not logically necessary, is logically possible. How do you know that? Property dualists include David Chalmers, who's probably the best known contemporary philosopher of mind.
Many people hold that the brain is more fundamental than the mind, considering that brain events seem to cause mental events. For instance, administering a medication or a drug or alcohol can all change mental states. But this doesn't at all prove that the brain is more fundamental. First, it is fallacious to assume that causation between the mind and the brain establishes that mental states are just states of one's brain. For instance, consider that ontological identity is symmetrical. If x is identical to y, then whatever is true of x is true of y. However, causation is asymmetrical. If x causes y, that doesn't entail that y causes x. Except for the fact that the relationship between physical states and mental states is one of constitution and not causation, the physical states and properties and processes constitute the mental state, not the feeling, but the mental state itself. The feeling has no ontology in and of itself. Therefore, causation doesn't entail identity between X and Y. Consider that throwing a rock in a pond, the cause, creates ripples, the effect, but the cause and the effect are not the same thing. Moreover, the fact that brain states cause mental states doesn't imply that the brain is more fundamental, considering we have good reasons to suppose that mental states can cause brain states as well. First consider when I have certain type of qualia, such as seeing striking shades of the sky, that can cause another qualia in me, such as a feeling of awe, which will cause a physical effect, such as goosebumps perhaps, or the desire to reach for my camera and take a picture. These are all circuits that are happening demonstrably in your brain. So does the thought create the molecule, or the molecule create the thought? Or are they simultaneous expressions of a deeper, transcendent reality that we are inseparable? Well, you, I think we should wander off the, the, uh, the specifics of oxytocin. You, you, he's just described an experiment where you can actually answer that question. If I give you a shot of oxytocin and it changes your level of trust, then, the, then the, it's not just mere correlation. I mean, we've run that we've run it both ways. So but that's I what can he just increase trust, and it can generate yeah, oxytocin yes, okay. too. But, but if trust is just the brain in one state, then you have the brain influencing its future states. You haven't gotten out of the brain and got an, an, an ectoplasm. Trust. Or a... Seemingly, my mental states can cause physical states. Uh, no. Now first notice there can never be any type of evidence against the idea that my mental states cause physical effects in my body and the only type of evidence against causation from mental states to physical states would be an experiment where one could show that mental states occur after physical states. What's your point, Vanessa? Because if mental state M occurs after physical state P, then mental state M cannot cause physical state P. However, the only way to find out when mental state M occurs is for a subject to report when she feels a mental state. If All right, so here's another error. Derezd is treating mental states, at least their occurrence, as if they are like on and off switches, as if a mental state just switches on and then switches off. That's not the case. As I alluded to in my first video, Mental states aren't just given to you as immediate experiences. The givenness of a particular mental state is something that actually has to develop, as Marvin Minsky talks about. So when uh, those philosophers talk about how sensation and subjective experience is immediate, that's very funny, because what it means is their model of how their mind works is so simple that it just divides into uh, real and imaginary. And so uh, I don't have much respect for those philosophers because it's not immediate. In fact, if I take parts of the brain out, you don't see that. If I take other parts of the brain out, you say you see it when it isn't there. And there are lots of things that can go wrong with that process. The subject has the ability to report when she feels a mental state. That means the mental state is causing a physical effect in her body, such as the vocalization of when she felt a mental state. But if a mental state causes her to vocalize something, that already proves that mental states cause physical states. It's not about when the mental state occurs. It's about when the mental state becomes given to you 
when you become conscious enough of it such that you can articulate it, when it's linguistically given to you. Thus, there cannot be any type of scientific evidence against the idea that mental properties, which we have already established exist, cause physical states. There is no real reason to suppose that the physical is any more fundamental than the mental. Total fucking bullshit. So on a scale of 1 to 10, in terms of badness, 1 being very, very good, 10 being very, very bad, I would say that this video is... OVER 9,000!